afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this joint presentation uh, by the Osher Life Learning Institute at UMass Boston uh, and the Massachusetts General uh, Senior Health uh, within the Division of uh, Geriatrics and Palliative oh. Medicine. We're very excited to do this joint venture in an effort to reach out to all of our lifelong learners and ensure that they are getting the best information about where we're at now in terms of our, our coronavirus and all the other fabulous things we're dealing with uh, right, right now in this time in history. So uh, all that being said, I want to introduce our co-host, uh, Jim uh, Hermelbrock. So take it away, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Hermelbrock. Um, I am the director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute um, at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. It is a great um, pleasure to be here with our um, partners as well, and we're excited to offer this to our members. OLLI is a lifelong learning program um, that is housed with the Gerontology Institute with McCormick Graduate School of Public Policy. We offer older adults some great programs, both within the classroom or actually on Zoom um, this semester. And it's a really great opportunity. And as our members like to say, they learn for the love of it. And so it's a great way to exercise their brains and keep connected with everyone. So that's just a little bit of information about Ollie at UMass Boston. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Susan. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Susan Edgman Levitan, and I'm the director of the Stokel Center for Primary Care Innovation at Mass General. And I want to add my welcome um, both to everyone who's attending today from the OLLI program and also all of our senior health um, participants. And I also have to say that I have many friends who are huge fans of OLLI, and I'm looking forward to getting to enjoy some of your courses um, in the future. So today, um, a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, everyone is muted, so we eliminate all the background noise and can hear all of our speakers very clearly. Um, if you want to view the full speaker, like you're seeing me right now, and you've seen Jim and, and Dr. Russell, um, you can go up to the right-hand corner of your screen and click on speaker view, or if you want to see everyone else on the call, you can click on the gallery view, and you'll get the, um, the Hollywood Squares version of Zoom, where you can see all the other participants. We also want you to know that in case um, your screen gets jumpy um, or the picture of the speaker gets jumpy, um, you can stop your video in the lower left-hand corner and that often will help improve your video connection um, and improve the picture that you're seeing. For questions, and we really encourage you to submit questions um, throughout the presentations, Please use the chat feature, which is at the bottom of the screen, right in the middle. You click on that and send a message. It will go out to everyone. Um, and we will try to address as many of the questions that come in as possible um, throughout the presentation. But we'll do all of that when all of our speakers have finished. Um, the other thing I just want to uh, make everyone aware of is that anything you write in the chat, we can all see. And anything you show on your screen, we can all see. So we ask you to please not share any medical um, advice or questions um, or any personal medical um, issues because you'll be sharing them with a lot of people. Um, but we do encourage you to please get in touch with your doctor if you do have any questions or any medical needs. Um, so we have gotten a few questions ahead of time and we'll address those um, when our speakers finish. And with that, I want to introduce um, everyone you'll be hearing from today. So our first speaker is Dr. Um, Ravi Bhattacharya, who is an infectious disease specialist at Mass General. And he also is our 2020 Department of Medicine Transformative Scholar. Um, so I think you'll really enjoy hearing a lot of information about where we are with the COVID pandemic. And then we're going to hear from Dr. Erica Wilson, who is a member of the Palliative Care Division at Mass General. And she also is a member of the Continuum Project 
and helps us work on all of our connections via um, our medical records, our patient gateway, which is our portal, et cetera, to help support all of our patients' needs. And then we'll hear again from Dr. Matt Russell, who is the clinical director for um, geriatric medicine in the Division of Geriatrics and Palliative Care and the ambulatory director of senior health. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Bhattacharya. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for the invitation to, to speak. And I, I am going to try to cover a lot of ground, but I will try to do it clearly and briefly so that there are time for questions at the end. Um, as, as Susan said, my name is Roby Bhattacharya. I'm an infectious disease doc at Mass General. Um, and I was on service during the, during the first couple weeks of April during the surge of cases um, that the Boston area experienced. And so I've learned a tremendous amount about the virus over the course of this year and have been really humbled by it. Uh, and so I just want to be clear up front that what I tell you is the best that I can synthesize of, of the literature about COVID as of right now, but it will almost certainly change in the coming months. Um, I would say things are stabilized, like what we think we know about the illness is stabilizing a bit more now than it was, say, back in February, March, and April. But it's really just amazing how much the world has changed in eight months because of a single small virus. Um, it's something that I think nobody alive has seen before. Um, so I'm going to try to cover COVID basics, strategies to stay, stay, to stay safe, including around travel, um, vaccination issues, both for COVID and for flu and for other things, testing and treatment. Um, and so that's a lot of ground, but I'll do what I can. And if you only remember one thing, it's that there is no one thing that, that makes this all better. But I think if, if I could synthesize it one way, it's to respect the virus and to like sort of take actions that convey respect, that respect for the virus. So with apologies that many of you who follow the news closely may know some of this, I'm going to start with just my brief summary of the basics of COVID. Um, I will also assume that if people couldn't hear me, someone would have told me that by now. Um, so uh, it's a highly contagious virus. It is transmitted by primarily the respiratory route, but it's not really only a respiratory virus. It has systemic impact. And I think that's part of what makes it different than most of the common colds that it's related to and that we deal with all the time. It can actually infect many, many different cell types. And so it gets in through the lungs, but can cause problems kind of everywhere. Um, and it has, had, it has a remarkably variable course in the people who are infected by it, from actually no symptoms at all, um, all the way up to an including fatal illness. And I think probably people know this by now, but um, I think it's actually one of the most important things that we learned is that it can actually cause a large number of asymptomatic infections and be transmitted by people without symptoms. That was not clear initially, and I think really contributes to how it spreads and what makes it so hard to contain. The highest risk for transmission seems to be early in illness and often before symptoms arrive, but actually it becomes progressively more severe over time. So generally you won't become really ill right away with it, but you may become ill over time as weeks pass with the illness. Um, the, the typical time we would see people coming to the hospital was, oh, I, got, I got sick about a week ago and now I'm just, it's just gotten progressively worse or sometimes even suddenly worse, worse but a week in. The other really clear thing that we've learned about it that was actually clear from the start was that there is striking age dependence to the mortality. Now that's true of many things. That's also true of flu, um, but it is just more prominent with this. I think because the overall um, uh, severity of this illness is greater, it just becomes more striking to the point that above the age of 70, it's about a 10% mortality um, for those who get infected. And then it gets about five times less with each decade of life below that. That's, that's sort of at least a, a general rule of thumb. And that's actually the most striking risk factor um, for outcomes. The other risk factors to know about, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, obesity, they all confer worse outcomes, but none as striking as age. The other thing to know is that it has a highly variable impact in different places and over different times. There's a lot of variability of who's a hotspot when, and this can really change quickly and be really hard to keep up with, but it has important consequences for how we act. And so I would just say trying to keep up with the latest trends in your area um, is, is important because things change. And the Boston area is actually a much better place now than it was in March and April. Um, and so behaviors that may have been really risky in early April are less so now. And, and that's something to keep in mind. I want to touch briefly on immunity. Um, we still are, this is an area where our, our knowledge is far from complete, but we do know that, for instance, antibodies form. 
to this, to this virus. And that other kinds of immunity beyond antibodies also form to this virus and that we can measure them. We don't really know how long they will last because not enough time has passed, but we do know that repeat infection, while it's been described, and I think just in the last couple of days very convincingly described, it's really rare. And that's actually very good news, that at seven or eight months, it's not a common thing, is good both on its own and also for what it means about vaccines, which I'll come back to later. But we can really only make vaccines to infections where the natural infection is immunizing. We've never succeeded. If, if infection doesn't confer immunity, then we can't with a vaccine. So the fact that this does is, is promising. It doesn't guarantee that a vaccine will work, but it at least makes it possible. Um, but how long this immunity will last, we can't know because only a few months have passed since the first human was infected, which is just um, kind of mind boggling. It's the first time that I've had to deal with an infection like this. The last thing I'll touch on for basics is seasonality. And just briefly, we, we know now, I think it's actually been clear for some time looking at other parts of the world, but we know convincingly now that summer was not enough to stop this. But I actually worry that summer has been helping, even though it's been breaking loose in a lot of parts of the country. What we know about related coronaviruses is they transmit better in the cold and in lower humidity. And also they transmit better when people stay indoors more. And so I'm actually, I am quite worried that although we're looking good now in Massachusetts, I'm keeping an eye out for the fall and winter. Um, strat so I'll move on to strategies to stay safe and keeping mindful of the time. I wanna be about halfway done at this point. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember, I'll come back to this. If you remember one thing from my talk, respect the virus. There's no magic bullet. There's no one thing you can do to stay safe. But the key principles are masking, distance, physical distancing, and staying outdoors as much as you can. That all helps a lot. Um, so washing your hands is important for any sort of viral, respiratory viral transmission, not touching your face, keeping your hands below your shoulders at all times is a good rule of thumb. But really the sort of, um, the most prominent risk factors seem to be just proximity to other people who are infected. And remember that other people may not know they're infected. And so that just means, unfortunately, staying vigilant, respecting the virus, keeping distance from other people, and, um, and keeping your mask on when you can. Uh, there's been a lot of noise in the press about airborne or droplet transmission. I think that I would just leave that aside. I think almost everything is actually a, on a spectrum. There's not one answer to that. And if you remember that it can be transmitted by breathing, um, that is A, concerning, but B, important to remember. And that's why masks help. In terms of the kind of mask, I would say um, cloth or surgical is probably fine for general use. And they both protect the wearer and they protect others from being transmitted if you happen to be, if the wearer happens to be infected without knowing. Both are true and both are really important. And so I think if everybody wears a mask, there's a lot less virus being put into the air and a lot less virus being inhaled. And that's kind of an ideal situation to keep spread down. The very fancy N95 masks are what we wear in the hospital, not even all the time. So around the hospital, we just wear simple surgical masks. But when we're going in to have close contact with a patient who is infected or doing a procedure that will generate aerosols, that's the only time that we're wearing N95s. I think for general individual use, it's probably a bit much. They're actually quite a bit less comfortable to wear. They're supposed to be personally fitted. So you should make decisions that, you, that fit your own personal risk. But I think simple surgical or, very, or good thick cloth masks are good. And a rule of thumb is if you blow with your mask on, you shouldn't be able to feel it with your hand, or at least very, very little. It should be very different than, um, than blowing without a mask. And if you cannot feel it, um, then your mask is probably good enough. They only work if you keep them on, obviously, too. And you'll see people with them hanging around their chin, and that's not helpful. So try to be outdoors, try to wear a mask, and try to keep your distance from other people. Now, that said, what can we do to see family? And, and safety is always relative. And, and so I think COVID is only one consideration. It's a really large one in the world right now. But it's only one consideration in safety and in life. So again, if you keep in mind respecting the virus, then you can start to make individual choices sort of within that framework. Um, first, of, first things first, it is safe to come to the hospital. It's safe to seek medical care that you need. I think if you have a truly elective um, condition to be managed, that may be something to defer, but any essential medical care, we have learned, medical facilities have learned how to keep our patients and our staff, staff safe in routine encounters. So. You, sh you can find a safe way to come to the hospital if you need to come see us. You can find a safe way to come to see your doctor if you need or want to see them. Um, so consider the, if you're going to try to plan family gatherings, I'll tell you what we've been doing. So 
we've actually seen my wife's parents who are in their 70s. We go to visit them and we actually hang out with them outdoors. They're a, they're a several hour drive away. We will drive to see them if we've all been, if we know we've all been safe in the past couple of weeks. If we have planned to see them, we'll actually quarantine more than, more so than usual and ask them to do the same. And we will come together in an outdoor spot. We'll wear our masks and we'll see them. My parents, also in their 70s, unfortunately live a flight away, and it's not just one, but two flights. There's not even a direct flight. We've actually not made that journey. We see them on video chat. And that's been really hard, but that's been the concession that we make, because we felt that we can't control our risks enough for that. But everybody has to make that decision for themselves. The way I'd consider that is where are the people involved? My parents are in a hot spot right now. They live in the Southeast. Um, what the recent history is of the people. So have they been able to quarantine or are they going to work and having a lot of personal exposures? And so I try to consider all of those things as I consider what's worth, what's a risk worth taking. Um, and what's the, also what are the personal risks of everybody involved? Are, are people in a good state of health? What is their age? What are their comorbidities? What would be the risk if they happen to get infected? And the other thing is not just to think about the gathering, but getting there and getting back safely potentially puts you at exposure. Driving in your own car with people you live with is safer than than um, going out in public, but getting in a, you know, a cab is probably riskier than all of those because it's close quarters and maybe the windows aren't open. Um, and then remember too about what you've been doing the two weeks before and what you plan to be doing the two weeks after, that's about the period in which you worry about infection. We can't control everything, but careful planning can help. I, I see that I'm running up against time, so I wanna get quickly through testing, flu shot, uh, and then vaccinations and treatment. So there are basically three kinds of tests the PCR test that we do looks for viral RNA, and it's really sensitive because it, it makes a lot of copies of the virus. That's what we use in the hospital. Um, but it's also quite slow, depending on where you are. Actually, in Massachusetts, we're fortunate that these can be done quite quickly. But that's sort of our bread and butter test in the hospital. Um, there are antibody tests. And I would actually argue those don't have a very big clinical role yet. They tell you, they look for your body's response to the virus and it takes a couple weeks to form. So they basically say, have I been infected at some point in the past? They don't tell you if you're infected now. So antibody tests are serology tests. Those might be important in the future if we learn that they convincingly confer protection, but we just don't know enough yet. There's not like a passport to, a, to going out and doing whatever you like. And then the third kind is these rapid antigen tests that are less sensitive than PCR, but they look for actual physical parts of the virus. They try to detect it. The advantage there is that they can be done really quickly. And I think that's kind of a, there's late, lately been a lot of buzz around doing this early and often. If they're cheap and quick enough, then they might actually allow us to behave in a way that's different because we can be confident. We took a test today that was negative. We're probably not highly infectious. We haven't really come to a point where we can do that yet. Um, where we can really implement that yet. So a negative test is unfortunately not a passport. I think it's a helpful part of a societal control strategy, but I think you should always protect yourself because you don't know how other people are, are behaving and you don't know the perfect performance characteristics of those tests. And so I would say testing is an important part of a societal strategy, but not a way out from vigilance, respect for the virus, masking and distancing. The easiest question I was asked to cover is whether you should get your flu shot this year. Yes, you should get your flu shot this year. It's safe to come to clinics, Flu shots are really important every year, even if they're not perfect. Aspirin is not perfect for stopping heart attacks either, but they're a really important part of making flu less severe, making you less likely to transmit it to other people and protecting you from getting it in the first place. Please get your flu shot. It, we can keep you safe at medical facilities. Um, and then COVID vaccines, an area of rapid and really unprecedented research. The fastest we've ever as a society made a vaccine before was for, was four years for months back in the 60s. And we're at a place for six, at six months in where we have multiple candidates in phase three trials, which is sort of the next step towards, an effective, towards proving efficacy, basically proving that it works and that it's safe. I have not seen anything to make me pessimistic. Um, and I'm really hopeful that this is a way back to something, to some semblance of what, of like lack of vigilance in our society, but we are not there yet. It's important to keep that in mind. It's still early, but we might've learned that infection didn't protect us. And that would have been a real big blow for, to a vaccine effort, but we have not learned that yet. It seems like infection is protective. The early studies for vaccines, they can't tell you if they protect from infection, but we know that they generate good antibody responses in people. That's also good news. So everything that I've seen on the vaccine front is optimistic, but we still need to do the big large-scale studies to know that it's safe, 
to know if it's effective. And I am hopeful that with the many candidates out there, there may be some. You may start to hear that MGH is offering, or maybe other hospitals in Boston may be offering participation in phase three trials. If that is something you wish to consider, first of all, thank you. I have sort of viscerally felt the importance of medical research in a way that I never had before um, with this illness that we know so little about. But second of all, please discuss it with your physician um, so that you can learn both the details of the vaccine and the details of your health that might impact that. Last thing, treatment. I will just summarize this by saying that we've gotten better at treating this illness in just six short months. There's an antiviral treatment called remdesivir that clearly helps. There's an immune suppression treatment called dexamethasone that clearly helps and saves lives. There's recently been some noise about convalescent plasma. I'd say the data are still a little bit mixed on how much or if that actually helps. The most important thing I wanted to say about this is we are getting better, but it's still a very serious illness. There are no magic bullets. And for steroids, dexamethasone, you may read about this in the news and hear that it's helpful. It is not helpful at home. It's actually probably harmful to take at home. So at least don't take it to try to prevent COVID. The steroids, the immune suppression is only helpful late when you're severely ill and only if people are already in the hospital. So basically talk to your doctor before taking something for COVID. So to summarize, respect the virus. It's really contagious, even from people without symptoms. Try to mask, try to stay physically distant from other people, and try to stay outdoors when possible. I know it's not fun, but it's the best way that I know of to stay healthy. It's also important to wash your hands and minimize touching your face and to clean things, but really it's the contact with other people that has seemed to be the more prominent way that this is transmitted. If you're going to hang out with people, I know that's important, and, and we can't just put it off uh, forever, but consider the circumstances of the, tr of the trip carefully and each person involved, where they've been the last two weeks, where they will need to be for the following two, how you'll get there and how you'll be able to get back. Testing is important for a society, but a negative test is not a passport, for, even for yourself and certainly not for the people you'll see. Please get your flu shots and other recommended vaccines. Stay tuned about COVID vaccines. And, um, and there's no magic bullet for treatment, but we're slowly getting better. So again, respect the virus. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions later. And now I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Wilson. Hi, that was, that was super helpful. Thank you for that great summary. Um, so I'm Erica Wilson. You heard from uh, Susan that I'm a palliative care physician at Mass General. One of the other things I do is I help um, train our staff and patients and families to engage in what we call what matters most conversations. And so uh, helping people think about what is most important to them, what their values are, what's their, what are their priorities, specifically in the setting of uh, medical illness. Um, and I, um, I think there's so many reasons why it is important to have these conversations in general, even before COVID, even more important now that we're facing this very serious um, illness. And in some ways, one of the reasons to have these conversations is that now more than ever, I think many of us are longing to be kind of seen and known um, and, um, and in community with each other, with our family, um, and with our, with our providers. And there is a hanging, you know, as we just heard, there's a lot of hanging worries and anxieties about COVID. And so having some practice at thinking about what's important to you is, is really helpful. I'll, I'll tell you a little story about uh, my mother. She's 93. Um, my son and I moved in next to her several years ago to help her out. Um, my dad had passed away and my mom is, my dad was an artist. My mom is a textile artist. This is a very kind of creative family. She's very creative, charismatic. She's very easy to love. <laughs> She's super difficult to help. <laughs> she, she is a woman who has been um, incredibly independent her entire life. Um, my parents, you know, in the 50s, like took off across the country, lived in Mexico for many years. Um, she has developed a walking um, uh, habit and so she walks every day and has for years and she started walking after she she had to stop jogging she walks around our town wearing these big floppy hats and multicolored jackets and wide-legged pants everybody knows her and what has happened over the last several years as her 
as her medical situation has changed, she has had to make adjustments to her life. So um, her, um, she's beginning to lose her vision. Um, she was a big reader and she's starting, starting to now use um, audiobooks. She walks with two canes now because she's fallen several times. And, and so I point this out because what is important to her has changed necessarily from when she was 50 to when she was 70 and now that she's 90, um, her priorities have changed. And so these are conversations that have to evolve over time. And we in, at Mass General, we have developed a tool in our electronic medical record where we can record these conversations and see and monitor how they've changed over time so that as a community, we can all know what's important to our patients and um, take that into account as we're thinking about making medical recommendations. So it's, it's a very brief example. She has blood pressure that's very labile. It goes up and down. And we have had to work, my brother and I and my mom, with our cardiologist and primary care provider to think about how important is it to keep her blood pressure at a good, healthy level versus our concern that for her fall. So if blood pressure gets too low, it puts her at risk for falling. She's a walker. And so we have had, so that's, this is this question of like, what is, what gives your life most meaning? What's really important to you? And how do you adjust your medical care to kind of support your life and your priorities? So that's kind of a, a, a a kind of everyday example. In the setting of COVID, the urgency of this skyrockets. And so in April, um, when we were in the midst in Boston of this very serious um, flood of COVID patients, I was sent to the emergency room with some of my colleagues. And we had patients who were coming in and, and as you've heard, sometimes very suddenly got sick. So they, were, they, they began to have symptoms and then it felt like almost overnight, they got much sicker, came into the, into the emergency room. And so we would put on our gowns and our hats and our, you know, all of the PPE and go into rooms to, to see patients and ha really having to make difficult decisions quickly. And as you can imagine, when you're very ill and, and very stressed, hard time to make a decision. In COVID, families are not allowed in with you. So conversations that are happening alone. So I would go in with my cell phone or with an iPad to try and get patients' families on the phone. So one really important thing to think about in the setting of COVID, and I think of the first step in this what matters most conversation is, think about who knows you really well. Who is the person that you want, you think of it as a, a trusted decision maker, who is that person who, if you arrived in the emergency room very sick, who would we reach out to? Who would you want your medical team, the doctors and nurses taking care of you, who is the person that they should reach out to? So the first thing is, is set a trusted decision maker in Massachusetts that's called a healthcare proxy. Um, really, it's best to have two. So a, a principal person and an alternate. And then the second part is have that what matters most conversation with those people. So they know, my mom is very clear. <laughs> my brother and I know how independent she is. She, we know that she would never want, if she could not recover to a place where she could do the things that she would want to do. She would not want to be dependent forever. She would not want to be in a nursing home. And while that's a really hard thing as a daughter to think about being in a position where I have to struggle to make those kinds of decisions, it is a gift really for me to know if I get into that position, what's important to her. Um, I know that we don't have a, have a ton of time. Um, there are things specific to COVID to, to think about. Um, one is just generally, if you were to get very, very ill, what's important? The specific questions to think about that your family will be 
talking with the doctors about is um, the possibility of going to an ICU if you get so sick that you need critical care. And then the other big thing that we are all very much aware of is the is needing to be intubated. So that is when a, a tube is put in to kind of help you with breathing. So these are, again, scary things to think about, um, but goals and values, what's important to you, this will allow your, the pers your family, people you love, to talk to the doctors to make sure those medical decisions that are made help to support what's best for you. Um, so I guess in summary, for what matters most is to think about what your hopes are, what your worries are, what are your priorities in terms of your medical care, appoint a healthcare proxy or a trusted decision maker, hopefully two, and talk to them about those things. And include your doctors and, and, and your medical team in those conversations. And, and I'm happy to think or talk more about this um, when the rest of the speakers have spoken. Dr. Russell. Oh, great. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Drs. Wilson and Bhattacharya. So I'm going to speak to how do you stay in touch with healthcare during the pandemic? And we already talk, touched on a couple of very key features um, that I do want to also just highlight for emphasis. Uh, the first part is infection control. And while COVID is at the top of our list of concerns, it's also important for us to make sure that we have the routine healthcare maintenance for a lot of the other vaccines um, that prevent us from getting quite ill during the winter months and in general. So definitely the flu vaccine, also the pneumonia vaccine if you have not received one, if you're over the age of 65 or have underlying chronic conditions. And similarly, the Shingrix or, or the shingles vaccine um, these are, are, are very much indicated vaccines for our patient population in our senior health practice. I can speak to some of the things we're doing in our practice, but if you are not already a, part, a member of our practice, as many of you aren't, please feel free to check with your providers because we're all operating under the same guidance uh, around routine healthcare maintenance in this time. And going on now to routine healthcare maintenance. So one of the downsides of the pandemic has been people fearing going to healthcare providers for out of concern of contracting coronavirus. Um, while that is well well intentioned, you can imagine that if you have a serious chronic or an acute illness that would require medical attention, we wouldn't want you to avoid healthcare for the hypothetical chance of acquiring uh, coronavirus. So if you're not feeling well, if your diseases are not well managed, this would be a time to connect with your healthcare providers. Um, and it's important to know for our own safety as patients, what are our healthcare providers doing to keep us safe when we go to see them? The first thing, many of you probably have already experienced this, is something like a Zoom call like this, except instead of being 52 people, it's just you and your doctor. That's one way we're staying in touch with you, to let you know that we are able to hear your concerns, that we are able to manage your medications, and we're able to decide together with you whether you need to come in for a visit to do, say, for example, a physical exam or some other kind of diagnostic testing. The second thing that most practices like ours are doing is reducing the number of people who are in the clinic at any given time to reduce the risk of transition, transmission of disease. So for example, the waiting room is sort of a thing of the past in most practices. We don't want you sitting in and reading those five-year-old magazines. <laughs> Though that's good news. We want you to arrive on time for your visit, ready to go, you'll be whisked into the room where your vitals will be taken and you will not be seeing other, other patients. Similarly, we have all of the hand washing and mask stations that, that everyone has to go through, screening tests to make sure, or screening questions to make sure that someone isn't coming in when they actually might be symptomatic and should go to another kind of clinic. Um, 
and then a one flow in and one flow out of our clinic to ensure that there's not uh, crossing over with other patients. We are trying to reduce the, the, the feeling of our patients to have to come in with every visit. Many of, many of our chronic disease management concerns can be handled in conversation with the patient and their family. So one of the core teaching parts of, of being a doctor is 98% of, of, your, of your diagnosis comes from your history, meaning what the patient tells you. So we get a lot of information in talking with our patients to figure out what's the best course of action. Now, in terms of chronic illness management, making sure that our medications are up to date and appropriately dosed, making sure that any lab tests that need to be done to ensure that we're still in a therapeutic zone with those medications, that's all a conversation you should be having with your providers. Again, just stressing the fact that if you are having an acute problem, so a high fever, belly pain, a swollen, hot, tender joint, or something, this is not the time to solve it on your own. This is the time to reach out to your healthcare provider, discuss your symptoms, and you will be appropriately channeled to the correct place to expedite the diagnosis and treatment. The last thing I want to talk about, and I think that this is uh, I'm definitely preaching to the choir here, is we've talked about the, the, uh, the pandemic of an infection, but there is another pandemic that goes on, and I speak to this as a geriatrician. Isolation and lack of socialization and lack of engagement with other people is well proven to be a negative health impact concern, meaning if we are not, as social beings, engaging with other human beings, we start to atrophy a little bit. We start to shrink our world a little bit. And while many of us might like some of the social distancing, as a Boston driver, I'm all for it. It's great to have fewer cars on the road. But in terms of having a social life or just having intellectual discussions, book clubs, all these other things we do, going to our senior center, going to our, our adult learning classes, all of these things have been sidelined. And our patients and families have become lonely. And we can see not only physical deterioration, but also cognitive deterioration. And this is all over now the lay press, but we've known this, and this is one of the reasons why we started the town hall, we knew this pretty early on that this would be a risk. And as we're going into the fall and the winter and the natural isolation that comes with foul weather, it's going to be ever so much more important for you to schedule your life. Now, what does that mean? It means what activities are you going to do to engage your brain? They can be certainly solitary activities, your Sudoku, your puzzles, uh, any number of other acts, reading, um, but then also exercising your social brain. How are you going to socialize with your friends and family? Certainly the telephone is great to do telephone visits. For many of us who are doing the Zoom videos over and over, we get acculturated to this no longer being a barrier, and it says almost as if we are in the room. That's how much humans want to connect with one another. And it's so important. You literally should be writing down what you're going to do to stay connected. And last week at our last town hall, we actually had someone who was our residence and writer at Mass General say this, that writing can be an activity to keep your brain sharp. That if you say, what does COVID mean to me? Or what have I learned about myself during this, this time of, of isolation? Or what do I hope for uh, in the next year or so? These are all great prompts to get our mental juices flowing, and we want to do that. So um, I probably can stop there because I know we'll probably want to leave time for question and answers. So Susan, I'll just go to you to take it yes. from you. Yeah. So Dr. Russell, I'm going to throw some questions to you to answer very quickly because we've got great questions and not a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is... Um, 
we have several questions about what is the best timing to get a flu shot. And Dr. Bhattacharya, you may want to weigh on the, in on this as well. But Matt, you're on screen, so go ahead. I already secretly asked Dr. Bhattacharya to field that <laughs> question. True. So I will, I will take this Expertologist one. and specialismatist. Go ahead. Sure. So there's actually not um, firm data on, on, on timing, but I would say in general, I'm a fan of earlier rather than later. I think there's some concern, but unmeasurable of a waning of immunity towards the end of flu season, but that has to be balanced against the risk of getting flu before you get the shot. I think that's, that's an, a clear and known risk versus an unknown one. So I usually say September or October, no later than November. I think this year I would have that on the earlier side of that. So September or October. Are uh, we offering flu shots at Mass General now? We are in the process. So we're about two weeks away from being able to schedule our flu clinics. In, in our section in senior health, because our patients are, are over the age of 65 and have chronic conditions, um, they're going to receive the high, high, high dose vaccine. So if people are going to be getting um, their vaccine at say their local pharmacy, just make sure that you're getting the appropriate vaccination for your age group and medical conditions. And okay. the pharmacist will be able to help you navigate that as well. Okay. Um, Dr. Russell, another quick question for you. Is senior health open to new patients? It is actually, yeah, we are, we are, uh, we don't have a huge amount of, uh, of, of space in, in our clinic, but we are open to new patients um, with, we have two new physicians in our practice who are looking to grow uh, their panel size. And then we have our, our fellows, our geriatric fellows who are also accepting uh, new, new patients and they're supervised by uh, Dr. Higuchi and uh, by me. Okay, great. We might want to put the phone number in the chat so p people that are interested can see that. Um, there is another question about the flu shot, and that is, um, are there going to be any drive-through options at Mass General or anywhere that you all are familiar with? I know we've gotten that question on several town halls. Yeah, we, we, have, we have gotten that. There isn't anything uh, planned yet because this is sort of like need to have it in hand, um, but uh, and also need to have a place for people to drive through. So in Boston, that's a little that's a little challenging. So, um, but we are in conversation with uh, the, the the larger hospital entity to help figure this out. Okay, um, Dr. Bhattacharya, a question about: Do you have any recommendations for the best type of cloth mask? Are there any brands or any places that you recommend people getting them from? Yeah, so I actually don't have a brand to recommend. What I would say is literally there's a, I, I meant to do this and left my mask in the other room, but I would just hold a piece of paper up and blow on it. And that obviously moves. If you put a mask in front of you, it shouldn't move at all. And I tried this earlier and it won't, it won't move even a little bit. So really it's just how much is it. And, and that's mostly going to give a measurement of what protection you are offering to other people. Um, I don't think cloth masks in general are going to give as much protection to the wearer as a simple surgical mask would, just because the fit isn't quite as tight. And so what you're breathing in is going to be less filtered. But in terms of breathing out, if it's too thin and you can feel your breath either on your hand or you can move a piece of paper, keep shopping. I know that we're ordering things to our home and it's a little hard, but I, I unfortunately don't have um, the brands. But I, um, the other thing is just to wash. I wash my cloth mask by hand. Um, soap and water and hang it out to dry once a day. Um, if I hang it out at night, it'll be dry by morning. Okay. Um, another question, um, and I'm going to give this one to Dr. Bhattacharya, and we've had several questions about this in previous town halls, and that's actually recommendations about if someone wants to fly, um, do you, should you really be flying now? And if you do, what are precautions? I know some of my friends wear face shields, they wear raincoats, sure. they get rid of. What sure. do you recommend? It's a great question. I think one has to ask, like I would say, you should only fly for very important things. That um, it has to be a decision that each person makes, right? So it should be, on the one hand, it's always risk versus benefit. The benefit should be high. This shouldn't be a sort of routine trip, but an important trip. I think it can be done safely. What I would recommend is a mask. And for this, I would go with either a simple surgical mask or a fitted N95 that you've sort of given a trial run to so that you know you can tolerate it for the length of the trip. I would personally also wear eye covering or face covering, whether that's a face shield or, or goggles that wrap around. 
The data on those are a little bit soft, but the eyes are a mucous membrane and this gets in through mucous membranes. And so I would do both of those things. Um, and then the other thing is to say that there have been enough studies that airplane travel, because probably of the filtration system, it's safer than it might seem for sitting there in a box and breathing the same air as everybody. It's probably better than, it's almost certainly better than doing that in a restaurant for the same length of time. Um, I would try not to eat on the plane. I would keep your mask on. I would eat and drink plenty beforehand. I know they tell you to drink fluids while you're on the plane. That's going to be tough if it's an international trip, but if it's a short trip, just drink plenty of fluid beforehand. And if your medical condition can tolerate it, try not to take your mask off the entire flight. Um, and, but that's, that's, I guess, how I would handle that is a good mask. And in this case, I would try to get a medical grade mask. A surgical mask should do if it stays on you the whole time and a face shield. Okay, thank you. Um, while you're here, um, also, can you address a question about, um, do you think it's safe to have a CAT scan done now? And also, if you have to take a cab or public transportation, any recommendations about how to stay safe or what one should ask a cab company? Sure. Um, so the CAT scan, I would say the same thing I said about the plane trip, which is how important is it? I would hope that most CAT scans are important. And so you, you shouldn't get one for sort of routine screening that's not indicated by medicine. But if you're getting a follow-up scan, like I don't think it has to be just because you're urgently sick and your stomach hurts, of course you should get an abdominal CT. But if you have an important staging scan for a, a known cancer, I think that's also important enough to get. And again, it, we can come to the hospital safely. We can keep our patients safe. We can keep our staff safe. Um, and CT scans have a routine um, cleaning. We're actually also, for what it's worth, not actually scanning people with known COVID very often. In those cases, we are restricting it to really urgent situations. And so, yes, I think it should be safe to get a CAT scan if you have a medical indication to get a CAT scan. Cabs. <laughs> um, cabs are tough, right? Because you're getting into an enclosed space with someone who spends their day getting into enclosed spaces with others. So it's hard. You could ask if they have a partition between driver and passenger. Uh, uh, many cabs have implemented just a plexiglass partition. I don't know that there are studies, but it stands to reason that's helpful. You could ask if you can keep the window down, certainly at this time of year, that'll become harder in December and January. Um, and you can ask if the driver will do the same. And I would say that those are the best things that you can do. You can be driven by someone, I'd say the same thing applies to ride shares, right? There's nothing unique about a cab there. A ride share is also someone who's going around driving. In fact, a cab might have the infrastructure to have sort of systematically those partitions and a ride share may or may not, and you may have less ability to ask about that, right? Um, it's tough. If you're able to get driven by someone you already are exposed to, that's obviously a preferred situation, but that's not always possible. Okay. And so I would treat it like a plane in that you should wear a mask and face shield if you can, and that you should try to get the best air circulation that you can in a plane. You don't want to open the windows, but you at least have these HEPA filters. In a cab, you want to open the window if you can. Okay. Um, can you say something about, um, we had a question about home COVID tests. What do we know about those? So this is rel home COVID tests are relatively new on the scene. There was a saliva test that was just approved within the last week or so. I'm really excited about them in general. I think the jury is a little bit still out on how um, sensitive they will be to compare to other tests. But I also think that it is almost certainly true, if not proven, that the sensitivity will depend on how much virus a person is shedding. So I'm not sure it's going to be good enough to tell you definitively whether or not you have COVID in a hospitalized, in like a doctor-patient sense. But I suspect and cannot prove that it will be helpful in terms of telling you whether or not you're likely to transmit it to someone else. Now, I have to say it's really important to point out that it's not um, enough to do that. Like for that to work, it can't be done just once because a virus, you could have actually been exposed yesterday, but there's an incubation period that's variable. It can be as short as a couple of days, but as long as a, over a week during which you would test negative, but you might still be harboring the virus and it might come out later. And so until and unless we get to a place as a society where we're testing a lot, we're nowhere close to that. It's not a passport to, to freedom. But I think it's, it's really, I'm actually really excited about the trend. I would say that they're not quite a substitute for a nasopharyngeal swab. If you really have to know if what you have is COVID, if you're in a hospital, we're not going to do this, the home saliva test. We're going to do the sort of anterior nasal or nasopharyngeal swab and send it to our lab. But it's, I think, a really good option for home testing. It's probably going to be faster turnaround. 
Okay, I'm gonna give you one last question and can you say a little bit about what you need to do to protect yourself if you're traveling in a road trip or wherever and you have to use a public bathroom? Yes, um, so I think in general, if you are on, in a road trip and you're in your own car or driving with people you live with so that it's a kind of a contained exposure, it's not a new exposure, that's safer than most other forms of travel. And if you can store up your bathroom breaks around the travel, then that is probably preferred. But if not, um, I would say, again, treat it the way that you would to go into uh, um, a plane or a cab, which is to say definitely a mask, ideally a medical grade mask if you have access to one for that trip. But if not, then certainly a cloth mask is, mask is better than no mask. Um, keep space between you and people and other folks. And so that might mean waiting outside the restroom in a sort of better ventilated area until the restroom is empty, even if it's a multi-use place. And then try, if you can, be the one person in there um, at the time. And try to spend as little time in there as you can. And if you can cover your eye, your sort of face, all the better. But I think priorities are, are a mask and spacing in that situation. And I think I, we have time for one last question I'm gonna to give to Dr. Russell and then we'll have you close out. But I know you have experience on the MBTA. So can you tell us about how you're staying safe there? You're muted. Absolutely, I'm Charlie on the MTA. <laughs> So uh, I, it's, uh, I, will, I will say that, you know, as a commuter on the subway, um, I have been, I have felt very safe because people are observing social distancing. The, and I take it at all times of the day, the cars are virtually empty. And if not, everyone is spaced out. People are wearing masks. Um, you know, one thing that, that, this reminds me of, and I've said this before, is during the 1980s into the early 90s when we were talking about HIV risk uh, prevention, there was the concept of safe sex that then became sort of mutated into safer sex and the language of risk mitigation. And I think that that's what we're really talking about is, you know, what is the highest risk, ac risk activity for transmission and what is the lowest risk? Well, the lowest risk is, you know, being a hermit on a mountaintop away from civilization, that is the risk of infection, but the risk of the many other harms that that would incur uh, is, is not acceptable for, for most of us. And as we're going into our holiday season, starting in September and going through to the new year, it's going to be important for us as family members to have these conversations about what our gatherings should look like, how we're going to plan to be together, whether that means I quarantine for 14 days before I see, you know, my cousins or they quarantine and, you know, or we get a test, et cetera, et cetera. But these are things that it's, you're not going to get a, a clear answer for every eventuality. It is just sort of the common sense risk mitigation. Um, and the more people you add to your equation, the more risk of things breaking down. Um, so most of us are going to have a much scaled back holiday season this year, um, but that doesn't mean we can't uh, delight in one another. All right. Um, thank you very much. I just want to remind everybody that we're doing another town hall with Ollie on September 17th, where we're going to be hearing um, from some other infectious disease experts and also one of our geriatricians and palliative care doctors about things that people are doing to stay resilient and engaged during this period when so many of us are um, socially distancing. Um, so Dr. Russell, any last comments or goodbyes? No, I think this has been, I just wanna thank our speakers and also uh, the folks at the Ollie Center at UMass Boston. This has been, uh, you know, uh, this is a we all want to reach out to as many people as we can to help support one another through this uh un, you know i don't want to say unprecedented because we've that's a word that needs to go away with 2020 but these are unique times and uh to be together in whatever way we can and to build on this is really our hope so that we can stay connected and i wish you all good good health and a fabulous rest of the day thank you Thank you to all of our speakers and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Bye-bye.